If you are a visitor, we would uh, like to give you a welcome bag there at the, at the end of the service. Uh, there's also a connect card in your pew. Um, if you could fill that out and maybe slip it in the offering plate or give it to the person that gives you the welcome bag. <laughs> All right. Um, let me see here. The teacher appreciation school outreach for Donegal Junior High has been changed to one week later. It will be on Thursday, March 10th. So please sign up if you can help. Also save the date for the mother and daughter banquet on Saturday, May 7th at 12. See Virginia Vaughn for more information. There is a sign up for COGS on the bulletin board for Thursday, March 10th at 1130. The program will be Great Hymns of the Faith. And the selfs will be worshiping with us on March 6th. So if you have plastic bags for her ministry, um, then please bring them on Sunday. There's a big box out there. You don't have to wait until then, but please bring them on that Sunday. Uh, and Ray's, the Youth Outreach Center in Mount Joy, is hosting their fundraising banquet, and there are details on the half sheet that is in your bulletin. Are there any other announcements? Hey, wonderful. Keith? Good morning. Um, I have uh, one more quick announcement, and then we're going to be looking at our memory verse for this month and the month to come. Uh, the announcement for the youth, junior and senior high, next Saturday on the 5th, we are going to go hiking, a small hike up at Pinnacle Overlook, which is about an hour southeast of here. Um, so if you are a youth, if you know any youth who would like to come to that, or if you are a parent of the youth and you would like to join along, please do. And if your soul needs the outdoors, because ours does, um, that'll be this coming Saturday, just a small day hike at Pinnacle. Um, we'll leave here at 2 and arrive back here around 7, 7.30. I would like to know if there are two brave souls who are willing to stand up and share with us the memory verse from this past month. <laughs> do you really want to go? Anybody, any t two brave souls? Nikki, would you like to stand up and tell us? Hey, amen. Well done. Well done. We have a bottle of water, uh, shaving cream, uh, anything. <laughs> That was really well done, well done. Anybody else, now that they got a little primer, is there another brave soul? Micah 6, 8. All right. Well, hey, N Nikki, well done. That was really good. Next month's memory verse, um, and next month is very soon, isn't it? That's Tuesday? Is that Tuesday? Very soon. So we can get this on your calendar. Pin the, you can pin this up next to your calendar so you can start memorizing it. But it's Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be, be made known to God. Or the NIV says, present your requests to God. All right. Thank you. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time when we can all come together to worship. We thank you that you have allowed us to be part of your family. We pray for those who are not with us because of health reasons, that you would give them comfort and peace and strength and healing. We pray for those who um, choose to stay at home for other reasons. We pray that you would have someone reach out to them May it be one of us to welcome them back. We thank you that we do have the technology that we can't stay home to watch a service and, and praise you for the people who work behind the scenes to make that happen because we know that's a, that's a wonderful ministry. Lord, we pray for our country and we pray for the world. We thank you that you have already won the ultimate battle by conquering sin and death. We pray that you will bring comfort and peace and hope. We pray that eyes will turn to you because of everything that is happening, because you're the only one that can handle this. Lord, help us turn over our lives, the big things, the little things, and all the things in between. We love you, Lord, and praise you for your power, your might, your strength, your love, and your gentleness.
Lord, thank you for being faithful to us all the time. Help us to do the same in return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, good morning. We're going to ask that our boys and girls come up front. All of our boys and girls that are here, guys, today. Glad that you're here. And uh, we have been talking about the word this month. Anybody remember? Love. Good job. Love. And so this morning, we're going to talk about God's love. We've talked about loving each other and. how we do that. We talked about loving our brothers and sisters one week. And you know, when I think about God's love, I have several water bottles here. So maybe we could say this water bottle represents your love. And then you know what? You're going to grow and uh, your love is going to get bigger. And then your love is going to get bigger. And then it's even going to get what? really big. Okay. 
So, when we think about love, though, when we think about God's love, you know, God's love is certainly bigger than this, it's bigger than this, it's bigger than this, and it's much bigger even than this. If we could fill up this whole building with water, that's even not enough to say how much God loves us. In fact, I have a verse for you this morning. 1 John 3, 1, it says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that it is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Now, I want you to look at the word lavished. Boy, that's a big word. Can you tell me what that word, anybody tell me what that word lavished means? What's that? Thrown upon us. Yeah, yeah, thrown upon us. Like licorice. Sound, it does kind of sound like licorice, doesn't it? It does. So, I'm not sure where to go with that, but it is lavished licorice. So, but God lavished. That word means he gave us so much that it, when I think of lavished, it's like running over. So I wanted to illustrate that to you this morning, um, how much God has love for us. So this mug is going to represent us. Okay? So who is this? Who is it? Us. This is going to be us. Okay? Yeah. I'm excited too. What's this? Do any of you guys use this yet? No, your dad does, right? No? Your dad probably does? I bet you, bet you Pastor Keith doesn't use this, does he? No. No, yeah, he doesn't. Yeah. But when I think of how God lavishes his love on us, again, who is this? Who is it? Who is it? Us. Great. You guys are good. So this shaving cream represents what? God's love. Man, that's too much. But this is, this is God's love for us. That's a good question. How much saving cream does it have? <laughs> That's a lot of love, isn't it? Look, you can't even hardly. Can you believe this? Look, you can't even hardly see us anymore, can you? Why? It's so full of God's love, isn't it? It just keeps going and going and going. You think you think you got it now? Maybe more? Okay. okay. Well, you know what? We could keep going, but I have to preach. So we have to stop. But this isn't even... If we had a thousand cans of shaving cream and we filled the whole auditorium up, it still wouldn't be the amount of love that God has for us. And all the oceans of the world, all the shaving cream cans in the world... It doesn't even begin to represent God's love. But it's a good illustration, isn't it? You can't even see us because we are lavished with God's love. So a good way to think about it. Okay, here's a paper for you. Here are some snacks. Come on up.
you by singing Heavenly Sunlight. I hope your toes were tapping. Let's pray as we think about the offering this morning. Father, uh, I know you're not looking at our wallets. You're looking at our heart. And so uh, we offer up an offering of thanksgiving as you search our hearts and know our hearts, Father. And we want to please you. We want to do what is right. And we realize you are sovereign. You are the creator of the heavens and the earth, and you are also the sustainer of the heavens and the earth. And we're so grateful, Father, that your love is bigger than any big can of shaving cream. Thank you for lavishing your love upon us. Thank you for caring for us. Thank you for providing for us. Thank you for giving us everything we need for life and godliness. At this time, Father, we think about our monetary offering, realizing that everything we have and everything we are is a gift of, from you. So I pray, Father, that we can be giving with cheerful hearts, that we can see your money being used an amazing way as we reach out to the community, those around us, and all the different uh, groups that we have, the, the organizations of Awana, and how wonderful it is to interact with people and share your truth. So take our monies, Father, and use them in a mighty way, and may we bring you honor and glory not only as we give offering to you, but as we live our lives as a living sacrifice to you. Thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The kids are dismissed. Ages four to seven. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failure, you won't walk out. Your great love will. in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence you won't let go. In the questions your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa,
Thank you, praise team, for sharing with us this morning. I'm sure you have watched the news as much as I have this week, and uh, I've had a lot of inbox things come into my inbox about Ukraine this week, but I think probably the one that hit me the hardest was from Awana headquarters in, out in Chicago. There are 524 churches in Ukraine that have Awana. That represents 250,000 boys and girls that go to Awana every week in Ukraine. I would encourage you to go to YouTube and Google Awana clubs in Ukraine. It will take you right into an Awana club in one of the churches, and you'll see the faces of the boys and girls. You'll see the faces of the leaders. And when I watched that video this week, my heart ached. There are eight Awana missionary families in Ukraine ministering to those 524 churches. And so because we run Awana here, and there's Awana all over the United States, there's Awana all over the world... I don't think I realized until I got that email from headquarters this week about how big Awana was and how many children are being reached in the Ukraine with the gospel of Christ. And certainly this week's bombings and these things that have taken place has affected uh, many, many of those churches. And uh, so I thought this morning we ought to take some time and pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine who are going through this horrible atrocity that's being put upon them. So I'm going to ask Gary if he would come this morning, and uh, he's one of our elders, and uh, I'm going to ask him to pray specifically this morning for Ukraine, to play, pray specifically for those over five or 250,000 boys and girls and those 524 churches, and there's many more churches in Ukraine. In fact, Ukraine has been known as the Bible Belt of Russia. 
And uh, because the, the proliferation of the gospel in Ukraine has been so great, just like we have Lancaster County is like sort of the Bible Belt of the North, and uh, that's what Ukraine is to, to European countries. So, Gary, would you please pray specifically for that today? Let's bow our hearts and our minds now. Father, it is heart-wrenching to see what man can do to other fellow man. But our hope is not in man. Our hope is in you. And Father, today, we lift our brothers and sisters and our children who are living in Ukraine and going through this time, this tribulation, this pestilence. Father, we know it's not your will that we would suffer under the hands of other men. We may deserve it at times, but Father, our hope and our trust is in you. Our reliance is on you and in your sovereignty. And Father, we, we, we realize that it's difficult to understand why you would let this happen, and we don't try to make sense of it, but we know that you are still in control. You are still on your throne, and nothing happens in this world without your, without your permission. Help us to believe, Father, that you will see these children and these families, these churches and this country through this time of problem, through this time of war, not because they wanted it, but because they have to endure it for a time. We look forward, Father, to the time when you will restore all righteousness and justness to this place. And we, re we realize, Father, that it may be a, wait, 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 a long time off, we don't know how long that will be, but again, Father, our steadfast trust in you, in your love, in your mercy, in your grace, and in your loving kindness towards us will endure forever and ever if we place our trust in you. So again, Father, comfort them and help us to support them. If we can only pray, then that's what we need to do. And we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who strengthens us, leads us and guides us through your spirit living inside of us. Amen. Thank you, Gary. Well, if you have your Bibles or your phones this morning, open them to Ephesians chapter 5. We are continuing our journey through Ephesians 5. Uh, next week, Keith will be preaching. I'm sure he'll be in Romans. So uh, make sure you're here for that. I'm always excited when Keith gets to preach. So this morning we are in Ephesians chapter 5. So what is the darkest place you've ever been? What is the darkest place you've ever been? I remember growing up, we would go to, uh, it's called Tupperware Lake or Cranberry Lake up in the Adirondacks. My dad's sister owned a home there. You had to get on a, a, a boat to go out to where their uh, cottage was or their place was. And I remember at night as a kid uh, being there, and I remember when the lights were turned off, you could not see anything. I mean, you could hold your hand here, and you couldn't see a thing. And uh, the, the scariest thing was the total darkness, and then you would be able to hear the mice that were running around. And I remember one time was laying there, and one of those mice ran over the top of the bed. It was a scary place to be. But I loved it because at night we would go out, and even as adults, we've taken our kids up there. And at night you go out, and we would, they had a long dock that went out into the lake, and we would go out and we'd lay on the dock, and we would look up and look at the lights in the sky. And I mean, like when we look up at the lights in the sky around here, what? It's washed out because of all the light. But up there, it was amazing, the millions of twinkling lights. And we would lay there. We would lay there for hours because we would count the satellites as they would go over us. And we loved it. And uh, only in that darkness could you really see the light. Have you ever stopped to think about light and darkness so we could go back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, where God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who had existed in all of eternity, and all of a sudden, they created 
light here on earth. They created the heavens and the light, it says. And uh, then they created man. And so in that Genesis 1 and 2, we have light and we have God moving and working. And it's amazing. But all of a sudden in Genesis chapter 3, what happens? Sin enters the world. And sometimes we might ask ourselves, well, God, why did you even allow sin? Why did you even allow sin? And I'll put this for you to think about. God is light, and you would never really understand light without what? Darkness. You could never understand the brightness and the holiness of God without having something to contrast it to. So that is called what? Darkness. God is light. Sin is darkness. And so we have sin because it's such a contrast of the holiness and perfection of God. Last week in Ephesians chapter 5, we were introduced to this thought where it says, therefore be imitators of God. Last week in our message, we talked about how we are to imitate God in the way that we love. And again, our definition of love Love always does what? You're getting it. Love always does what's best for the other person. Let's say it. Love always does what's best for the other person. Turn to the person next to you and say it. Go ahead. If you don't ever get anything from me, you will get this definition. I promise you. Okay, hopefully some of you will have it written on your tombstones because Pastor Vaughn always said this, love always does what's best for the other person. In the last week's sermon, we contrasted love and how we're supposed to love others. And then Paul talked about the opposite of that, which is what? Which is lust. And lust always does what's best for myself. And so he contrasted the really good love to what the world would call love, and we call it nothing but lust. And so he talked about, we talked about that last week, and that we are to imitate God's love. Well, today we're going to look at our verses because we're to imitate God's light, his love and his light. So go ahead to the next slide. Here are our verses today that we're going to cover. It says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find but what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Let's pray, and then we'll look at our text for the day. Father, thank you this morning again that we are reminded here at Ephesians 5 that we are to be imitators of your love. And then this morning, we're going to see how we are to be imitators of your light. We are to live in light, Father. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today who is living in darkness, who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that today might be the day of salvation for them. Lord, help us for about these next 25 minutes to be able to focus simply on the Word of God, to be able to push all the things that lay ahead of us this day out of our mind, and to really be able to walk away understanding what it means to walk in light so that we can continue to be imitators of you. It is in your name we pray, amen. So the first thing I want us to think about this morning is the character of God. And in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it says this, This is the message we have heard from him and declared to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. 
And so when we think about the character of God and who he is, the Bible says that God is love. And now it says here in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, that God is light and there is no darkness in him whatsoever. Um, and we can, we can go back through the word of God and we can see God being light. We can go all the way back to the book of Exodus when God was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. We know that he did it with a pillar of cloud by day and led them out of the way by a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. So we see him as light there. Remember when Moses had gone up in the mountain to get the Ten Commandments? When he came down from meeting with God up there on Mount Sinai, what did his face do? It glowed because he had been in the presence of God. And his face glowed with light. In Psalms 104, 1 and 2, the psalmist says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O, o Lord my God, you are, my, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as it was with a cloak, stretching heaven like a tent or a curtain. And so here it says that God in all of his splendor, and all of his splendor is light. It's like a cloak. It's a cloak of light that is over him. So it says God is light. At the transfiguration in the New Testament, when Jesus gave the three apostles a glimpse of his full glory, he manifested himself as what? Again, as light. And uh, so we see over and over and over again that God is light. In 1 Peter 2.9, it says, For with you is the fountain of life. In your life we see light. So when we think of God and we think of his character, God is not only love, but over and over and over again, we see God as light. We went to John chapter 1, and uh, we looked. The scripture reveals that God, what? When Jesus came into the world, he, what? Came to bring light into the world. And it says Jesus is the light. So it's easy to see that the characteristics of God is light. There are two, two simple um, fundamental principles that flow from the character of God. And here they are. First of all, light represents the truth of God as embodied in his word. So, light represents the truth of God embodied in his word. In fact, in the book of Psalms, it says this, what? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So, we can see here that God, who this is his word, is, and this word is what? Light. Back in that, that time, you know, we don't have the big powerful flashlights like we have today uh, or the lights. Like, you know, you could take a flashlight and you could go out through the woods and that light would really light up your path for quite a distance. So in biblical times, when it says this, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What that's saying there in biblical times, really, it was usually a candle. And think about how much light a candle gives off. It doesn't give off. You can only see your next what? Step. And then you can only see your next step. It doesn't show you all the way what's ahead. And that's the way that we have to live life. Listen, we don't know what's down the road, but we have God's word that we can lean on no matter what's down the road. So his word represents light. It's a light unto our path. It shows us the direction we should be going. Why do we have you memorizing scripture? Why do we have you reading the word of God in our five by five by five plan? And if you're reading, we're getting ready to be in the book of what? Hebrews, very good. Some of you know where we are. This is a good time. If you are, haven't been reading with us, jump in the book of Hebrews with us. And, uh, but why do we have you do this? Why do we want you to read God's word? Because it shows you how to live. It is a light. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. So we need to be in the word of God every day. Every day I need that lamp to show me where to go. The second thing is scripture links light with virtue and moral conduct. 
And in the portion of Scripture where we are today, it does that. It shows us, listen, light is living a life that is what? Holy and righteous and just. Or you can live a life of sin, which is a life of darkness. So Scripture links life with virtue and moral conduct. So those are the two principles of light that we find in God's Word. So now let's continue through this passage this morning to see what he has to say. And the first thing is the contrast. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, here's what it says. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So here's a contrast. He says, this is what we were. We were darkness. When you were born into this world or when your child was born, no matter how beautiful that little baby looks, no matter how sweet that little baby is, that baby represents darkness. Then you begin to understand that around the age of two, (laughs) don't you? Yeah, right. You begin to understand it. When they get to those terrible twos, and they're hard to control, and they have their own little life, and you can see it. A few weeks ago, Logan was at the office. Logan is a character. (laughs) And so that particular day, he got out the door, and he ran, and I'm chasing him. (laughs) Heather's chasing him. And he turns around and he gives us this grin like, I got you. (laughs) It was so funny. But he's what? He's two, three, and he, he has some of that, that we all have that darkness that's in us. And so when we're born into this world, we are born sinners who are separated from God. And if we do not do something about that, if we don't come to know Christ as our Savior, we will die in darkness and we will live out eternity in darkness. He says, that's what you were. Notice that's past tense. You used to be in darkness. That was the domain of where you lived. Your father was the father of lies, Satan. Matthew 8, 12 says... We shall be cast into outer darkness in the place where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you know why hell is a place of darkness? Because heaven is a place of light. Because who dwells in heaven? God. Who doesn't dwell in hell? God. It's a place of total darkness. Yes, it's a place of fire, but it's a place of darkness. See, the most horrible thing about hell is not the flames. The most horrible thing about hell is simply this. You are eternally separated from God. That's the horrible thing about hell. Eternal separation from a loving God. A God who is light. And you are eternally separated from light. That's what you were, he says. This is what you used to be until you came to that point in your life and you said, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe you rose again the third day and I am putting my faith and my trust in you and you alone to take me to heaven. Again, he said, this is what you were. You were in darkness, but at the moment of salvation, at the moment you come to Christ, at the moment you realize you can't work to get to heaven, the only thing you can do is by faith trust in what Jesus did for you in dying for your sin. At that moment, you begin to walk in light. At that moment, he says, this is what you were, and this is what you are. You are light. 1 Peter 2.9 He called us out of darkness into light. Matthew 5, 14, it says, You are the light of the world. So we share the character of God. We are light to others. So there's the contrast. This is what you were. This is what you are. And if you know Jesus as your Savior this morning, you should be walking in light. And then in the text, he's going to show you what it means to walk in light. 
He's going to lay it right out there for you. So continue reading. It says, let no one, dis- uh, excuse me, back up to verse, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who, <laughs> I got, got lost here, sorry about that. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For as one time you were in darkness, but now you were in light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And then here's what it looks like. Here's what it looks like. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good, all that is right, and all that is true. So Paul gives you three words. He gives you three fruit. Here are three fruit of what it looks like to walk in light. And the first one he says, if you're a light walker, I love that, light walker. That's what 1 John says, we're to walk in light. So as Christians, we are to be what? Light walkers. And uh, here he says, listen, if you're to be a light walker, the first thing it means, the first characteristic is goodness. Now, this word goodness is interesting here. There are several different Greek words for goodness uh, in Scripture, uh, but this one is very specific. This one has a similar meaning to agape love, very similar in meaning. It finds its fullest and high expression in that which we willingly sacrifice or do for others. 1 Thessalonians 5.15, always seek after that which is good for one another and for all men. So this word says, if I'm going to be a light walker, I'm always going to be thinking about other people. As a Christian, life isn't about me, it's about others. We talked about that last week in the physical relationship of marriage. It's always about others. And so what does that look like? Well, first of all, you walked in here this morning on a Sunday morning to sing some great music, to hear a mediocre message, and then what? And then to walk out. But here's the reality of it. Did you come this morning thinking, who am I going to minister to today? Or did you come just for yourself? And so tomorrow when you go out into, to work or you, you, you know, if you're a lot of retired people here, you're going to stay home with your wife. Are you going to think about your wife? Or are you going to think about yourself all day? Wives, are you going to think about yourself all day? Or are you going to fix your husband a great dinner? I'm just kidding. Might be the other way around in some homes. But seriously, what, what this word goodness means, if I'm going to be a light walker and I'm going to walk in the light of Christ, I'm always going to put other people first and myself second. It's going to be God. It's going to be my mate and whoever else. When you go to work tomorrow, are you going to put those around you first? That's what this is saying, that listen, to walk in goodness, no matter whether it's in church, no matter whether it's here or or in, in the workplace, in the home, this word is about putting others before me. That's what it means to walk in light, because when Christ came into this world, he did what? He became a servant for us. He put us first. Why? Because he is light, and life is characterized by goodness. The second thing it says is characterized by righteousness. Righteousness. 1 John 2, 29 says, John, John says, We also know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him or born of God. Romans 6, 13 says, My members are instruments of righteousness. He's saying, listen, if you're going to walk in light, your, your instrument, your, your parts, your hands, your eyes, your feet, they ought to be instruments of righteousness, not unrighteousness. And so light, the second characteristic of it here is it, it's a righteous life. I'm living. I'm doing what is right. Again, it doesn't mean I'm going to be perfect. None of us are perfect. That's why 1 John is there. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so here's the thing is it's righteousness. And then the third fruit is what? Truth. Truth. 
The third fruit of light is truth. Truth has to do with honesty, reliability, trustworthiness, integrity, in contrast to hypocritical, deceptive, false ways of our old life of darkness. So when you look at these three words of goodness, righteousness, and truth, you can see goodness sort of represents how I work with others and how I treat others. Righteousness is about my relationship with God, and truth is about my own integrity of how I live out my life. And so if I'm going to walk in light, that means I'm going to be a person of integrity. I thought about this last night because last night I was sitting at my desk filling out this long form that I'm going to give to Phil Miller, who does my taxes. And I was thinking, you know, this is the amount of mileage that I have from last year. Here was a thought that went across my mind. Ah, a few extra miles, the government will never know. Or how, you know, I have two different churches that I worked at this year. I gave money to those churches. Ah, I'll, I'll, I could add a few thousand on. Government will never know. What are you shaking your head for? No, Marion. <laughs> trying to be my conscience? <laughs> now she's pointing her finger at me. No, that wouldn't be what? That wouldn't be truth. It wouldn't be truth. So see, if I'm going to be a light walker, I'm going to walk in truth in every area of my life. Those are the characteristics. And then, look, he gives you a command that's very interesting here in verse 11. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. He says, listen, take no part. Take no part. So he's saying, listen, don't participate. Don't become a partaker together with others. As a child of light, I shouldn't be partakers of darkness. As a child of light, I shouldn't be doing the things of the world that represent darkness. I should be walking in light. And so we are not even to have contact, he says, at all with fellow believers who are openly sinning. Now, we could go to 1 Corinthians, and we could see in 1 Corinthians, you have a brother who is overtaken in sin. And, and Paul tells them, listen, you shouldn't even be associating with him. As a church, you haven't dealt with him. You ought to put him out. And, and he says, listen, you should deal with him. And uh, Paul commands us, and again, in, in Corinthians, that not even to eat with a brother or sister who is living in sin. He's pretty specific about that. He says, I actually wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he should be an immoral person, covetous, idolater, reveler, or drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a brother. Whoa, that is a pretty difficult portion of Scripture, isn't it? But he's saying if you have a brother who's just living in sin and they want to continue to live in sin, don't even associate with them. Don't associate with that darkness that they're walking in. And so he, he gives this command to don't be a partaker don't associate with those who are continually walking in darkness. He says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things. So now the command goes to a commission. You're commanded, don't even eat with them, don't associate with them. And now he says, you are to expose them. To ignore evil is to encourage it. To ignore evil is to encourage it. To keep quiet is to promote it. And so we as Christians, we should take stands against sin. As a church, we should take stands against sin. We should take stands against abortion. We should take stands against the LBTGQ. We should take stands against that. doesn't mean we don't love them, we don't care for them. We should take stands against racism. We should take stands against drugs and drunkenness. We should take stands against pornography, sex outside of marriage, gambling. Um, and the list could go on and on and on. In fact, this summer, I'm going to do a series of messages called Hot Topics. So throughout the whole summer, I'll be dealing with all of those hot topics 
that we should be taking stands against. And uh, within that series, we're going to learn about that. The sin, the church is to take a stand against sin. Over in Matthew chapter 18, it says, If you have a brother who is overtaken in sin, then what are you supposed to do? Put it in the bulletin. No, you had to think about that for a second. I, that was just to catch you if you were sleeping, okay? No, you don't post people's sin in the bulletin. If, if we did that, we wouldn't have enough paper for this week's bulletin. That's just my sin. And so the reality, here's what it says. No, I go to them. What? Just myself. I confront them. If they don't repent, then what do I do? I go and get a brother or a sister. I take them. And then the brother or sister is the witness who sees not necessarily the sin, but sees that they won't repent of their sin. If they still don't repent of their sin, then what do I do? I bring it to the church. And the church then what? The church then confronts that person about their sin. And then still, if they don't repent, then the church votes them out. Then the church takes that stand. So there, there's a process that God says, listen, I need to expose darkness. I need to expose it. And that's our responsibility. That's what he's commissioned us to do. And so he says, this is what we're to do. Um, Paul goes on to say, it's disgraceful even to speak of things that are done by them in secret. Some things are so vile they shouldn't even be discussed or discussed with as little detail as possible. Then he moves on and he says this. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. He said, everything becomes visible in the light. Just recently, we had some painting done in our, uh, in our home. And uh, it was my son's company who came in and did it. And Joshua said to me, he said, hey, Dad, listen. He said, the last couple days that we've painted here, it's been cloudy. And he said, sometimes on cloudy days, you, you don't see spots that you miss. He said, so on a, on a day when there's sunshine, he said, I want you to go through and look and see. And so sure enough, two or three days later, it was a sunshiny day, and there was sun coming in through our um, sky lamps. And I noticed on this one wall that there were two or three places that they had what? They had missed because light exposes everything. Light exposes everything. That's why we as a church have the job to what? Be light in this dark world to expose sin. And then we end this morning with the call. And here's the call. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. It's interesting that he ends this portion of Scripture with a call, a call to salvation. The words are are adapted from Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, where it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. So Paul shows the prophetic meaning of that. He's saying, listen, when you're living in sin, when you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are a sleeper. Do you ever know anybody that sleepwalks? You know, sleepwalkers are not aware of the danger they're in, are they? I mean, they get up and they can walk and not even know that they could walk and go down the steps. They don't know that they could walk into something. They're unaware of the danger they're in. And people who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, people who are unsaved aren't even aware of the danger that they're living in. And so Paul is saying here, wake up, wake up, come on, get up. Don't die in your sin. Don't die in your sin. If you die in your sin, you will be separated from God in darkness forever. So wake up, O sleeper. Get up. Get into the light. Arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. 
So if you're here this morning and you are not 100% sure where you will spend eternity, today would be a great day to make sure about that. Today would be a great day for you to say, listen, I know I'm a sinner. I believe I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe he was buried and rose again the third day. And I'm putting my faith and trust in that and in that alone to take me to heaven. You know, think about the thief on the cross. How much work did he have to do to get into heaven? None, did he? Simply hanging on the cross, he couldn't do anything. All he could do was put his faith and trust in Jesus. And Jesus said, this day will you be with me in paradise. So you can live your whole life and you can do all kinds of good things and you'll still die in darkness and live in darkness in eternity in hell. Because salvation is only by faith. So if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, this last verse is for you. And then Christians, we should walk in goodness. We should walk in righteousness. We should walk in truth. We should walk in light. And we should be the light to a dark world. Your life, as you go out and live in your home, at your work, in your church, wherever you are, you should give forth light to draw people to the light. Let's pray. Maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, Dick, I am not 100% sure if I died today, I would go to heaven. I'm not 100% sure, but I want to be sure. Doesn't matter what your faith is or what your religion is. Doesn't matter what your church is. What matters is do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? And so if you're here this morning and you're not sure, you're not 100% sure if today would be the last day that you lived on this earth, that if something would happen today on the way home and you died and you slipped out into eternity, you're not sure that you would go to heaven. Right where you are in your seat, you could make sure of that. You could pray. Again, I say it all the time. It's not the prayer that saves you. It's the faith. Right there, maybe you could say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I look at my life and I see sin. We're all sinners. Jesus, I'm a sinner. But Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sin. I believe you died in my place. I believe, Jesus, that you were buried and rose again the third day having victory over sin and death and darkness. And right now, I'm asking you to save me from my sin. Right now, I'm believing that you died for me. You were buried for me. You rose for me. You took my sin. And I'm putting my faith and trust in that alone to take me to heaven. If that's your prayer this morning, I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I do want to pray for you. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed and no one looking around, if you prayed that this morning, would you just look up at me? We had a lady two weeks ago who prayed that, and on the way out of the service, she told me that. And we've talked several times since that day. But today could be your day. And so if you're saying, Dick, I am making sure today that I'm on my way to heaven. I'm making 100% sure of that. Would you pray for me? Just look up at me and I'll pray for you this morning. Not call you by name, but I want to pray knowing that you're accepting Jesus. Thank you. It's the most important decision we'll ever make. Father, thank you for this one who this morning has made this decision. Lord, I pray that you continue to work in their life. You would... Help them, and Lord, help us to be able to connect and to help to see them grow in their walk with God. Father, I pray this morning that you might use this text to help us to be light walkers. So we go out into this world that will, Father, be people who care about others and live for others instead of living for ourselves. That's what a light walker does. 
again, Lord, help us to mimic your love and mimic your life, your light. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning before we're dismissed, we have something very exciting. So this is Judith Mitchell, and you know the lady pretty well that's coming up with her. It's because Barb is Judy's sister. Right. Right. Okay. And uh, Judith has been coming now since last fall, I guess. Yeah. And uh, I got to go to her house. She lives down in Lancaster. And a uh, beautiful home and got to spend some time with her and got to know her a little bit. Her dear husband, Dick, right? Yeah. Went home to be with the Lord last April. Yeah. Day, you know, after Easter. day after Easter last year. Dick had been a, uh, was a retired Lancaster city policeman. How many years did he serve? 25. 25 years. <laughs> and uh, so um, not quite a year since her dear husband's gone to be home with the Lord and she had been going to the Church of God in the city of Lancaster and uh, decided that uh, since her sister went here, that she would make the trip all the way to Mount Joy. And she's been coming, and she, it, it's just a delight to hear her testimony of how she came to know Christ as her Savior and how she served in the church there in Lancaster. And so we are so happy that she's going to become part of the Mount Joy Church of God. It's always exciting to have a new sister in Christ. And so um, we know that she knows Jesus Christ as her Savior. And so today she's come to do that. So her and I together, why don't you come up here, Barb, too? And I'm going to have you read with your sister. I think that would be a neat thing to do. And we are going to read right here together, okay, the church covenant. It says, we do mutually and solemnly covenant and agree for the prom- promotion of our welfare, the salvation of others, and the glory of God to, to unite in church fellowship, to live in Christian peace and love, and to walk and live according to the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord, as he has revealed the same to us in his holy scriptures, which contain, as we believe, the only authoritative rule of Christian faith and practice. And moreover, we do solemnly promise patiently to submit to the order of God's house, that is to say, to the government and discipline of his church, and also to cheerfully obey the church's leadership. And then, Judy, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Have you been born again by accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior and the Lord, and do you covenant to follow and serve Him as Lord of your life? Do you accept the Bible as the inspired Word of God to make it your guide for daily living, and do you promise to follow the teaching faithfully? I do. And do you promise to pray and lovingly care for your fellow church members, and will you use your time and talents and treasures to further the ministry of Mount Joy Church of God. And I appreciate it so much. I talked to Judith on the phone the other day, and she said, Pastor, I can't do a whole lot anymore. She said, but I'm willing to do whatever. She said, I'm pretty good on the computer. (laughs) I thought that was really sweet, so she might be replacing Heather. Uh, No, I'm just kidding. So... But I, I, I really appreciated her spirit. I really did. You know, whatever I can do, Pastor, please, please let me. And so, church, why don't you stand? Well, hold on. I'm going to have you stand if you agree with this statement. Do you, the body of Christ at Mount Joy Church of God, pledge to support and welcome Judith Mitchell to, and to invite her into fellowship? to use the gifts and talents to build up this body as they contribute to the work and the mission of this church as God has blessed them. If so, rise and affirm. Amen. Bob, could you bring a chair down? So what we're going to have is we're going to have Judith sit right down here because it's hard for her to stand a long time. 
And we're going to come up and we're going to give her the right hand of fellowship and welcome her as a brand new member of Mount Joy Church of God. So you sit there, Judith. Well, amen. Thank you for being with us today and fellowshipping with us. Before you leave, come and welcome Judith this morning. Have a great day in the Lord. Thank you for being here. Okay, shake your